the next talk in these uh, in the um, session on on new innovation, new technologies that's going to, that will enable us to make their steps forward. Um, we have uh, Mike uh, Gruntman, uh, who's going to be speaking on energetic neutral atom imaging, the next step. Mike. Thank you. So I can, uh, so let me try, oh, there's no way to start the pointer, right? Okay. I will just go without that. Okay. So the NA imaging, uh, the next step. So I will start briefly describing uh, energetic neutral atoms and uh, the instrumentation that enabled to get where we are today, and then uh, what happened in terms of experiments and science discoveries. And uh, after that, I will focus on the challenges to improving the instrumentation that will bring the next step in the advancing science. So the DNA imaging, uh, as uh, you know, it's relatively recent uh, development in uh, space physics, and it has tremendous successes already and made a major discoveries. Uh, the, what has been done so far was based on the instrumentation development done in 1970s, 80s, and uh, early 1990s. So the next step in science uh, advancement would depend how we advance instrumentation further. So briefly, uh, energetic neutral atoms are produced in charge exchange uh, collisions. So when an energetic ion uh, collides uh, with the neutral atom and the charge exchange occurs, and if your energetic ions gyrate around the magnetic field lines when charge exchange occurs, neutral atom preserves the velocity of the ion and the stone from a slingshot flies across the magnetic lines. So you can remotely probe, image, study uh, the populations of energetic ions. So in some sense, it is similar to passive corpuscular diagnostics of fusion plasmas pursued since 1960s. Most common uh, species in space, it's obviously uh, hydrogen protons and uh, hydrogen atoms, but also other species are involved. And uh, in the imaging so far focused on studies of planetary magnetospheres on the heliospheric interface and uh, also the um, tenuous uh, neutral environments around planets like Mars and Venus were also probed. Now, uh, the energetic neutral atom fluxes that are detected are essentially the integrals along the line of sight over the ion distributions in neutral uh, atom uh, densities. So uh, the road to direct detection of ENAs was very difficult. It's actually the first time they were detected uh, 60 years ago optically. And there were enormous difficulties to detect neutral atoms. And uh, uh, the key is that you have to extract an extremely weak signal from the very strong background, several orders of magnitude. And also the fluxes are so small, you need a very large geometric factors of instruments to accumulate enough counts during the mission era. So with a few uh, brave people uh, started, started to develop instrumentation. It uh, began with a group at TRW, now, now part of Northrop Grumman in the 1960s in Los Angeles. So and, uh, since the very beginning, uh, the work in ANAs was concentrating on building basic foundations for the instrumentation. But also what happened very important in the 1980s was the serendipitous discovery of ENAs in space where the instruments that were supposed to measure energetic ions identified certain counts as coming from the energetic neutral atoms in the Earth's magnetosphere and also in uh, uh, the magnetospheres of Jupiter and Saturn by Voyager. So that was IMP-78, IC, and SF, uh, SA-81. And actually, the term inner imaging was coined in 1984 by Hank Voss and Ed Rolla for di in different perspectives in 1984. And in 1987, ENAs got to the cover of the JRL, uh, sort of showing the first time the potential of the technique. So what are the instrumentation that enabled this development? Well, first of all, these are ultra-thin carbon foils shown here. It's basically 10 to 20 layers, atomic layers of carbon freestanding. They're actually supported by high transparency metal grids. And these carbon foils are used for two purposes. One purpose is to strip ENAs. That means incoming ENAs uh, loses electron passing through such a foil and becomes an ion, and then you 
analyze the sign and separate it from the background, the UV radiation. The second is uh, using electrons knocked out from the foils by passage of these neutral atoms, and they're using them for time of flight techniques. Another technique that was developed is diffraction filtering. Basically, if you have a holes small enough, say comparable to the wavelengths in the UV, then the photons that create all this noise cannot go through, but ENAs do go through. And the third technique is conversion of incoming neutral atoms into negative ions on surfaces. So it's a very comprehensive review with 500 uh, plus references was published in 97 in the review of scientific instruments. So in 1990s, we finally got the era of ENAs. First major dedicated NASA missions put ENA imaging really in the forefront of research. So the Cassini uh, had an instrument, INCA, that uh, measured uh, ENAs uh, at the Saturn magnetosphere. Then NASA image mission carried three instruments that covered ENA fluxes, obtained ENA images and energy ranges from a few electron volts up to a few hundred kilo electron volts. And twins tried to do the first attempt in stereoscopic imaging of the magnetospheres. Now, the smaller missions also contributed importantly, and a number of countries actually got involved. It was Astrid, Mars Express, Mars, Ven Mars Venus, Sag B, Double Star, Chandrayaan. And also now ENAs are, are being introduced on the microsatellite and even CubeSat platforms. In a second, I will say more. In the heliospheric physics, uh, it was interstellar boundary explorer, IBEX, that measured the, uh, got maps in the ENAs of the uh, galactic boundary of the solar system and actually discovered the ribbon. And at the same time, uh, Cassini's Inca uh, discovered ENA belt uh, in a sli at slightly higher energies. So these are two things that uh, really challenge our concepts of interaction of the solar wind with the interstellar medium. And also another serendipitous discovery happened in 2006 when stereo detected ENAs at very high energies from 1 to 15 mega electron volts coming from a solar eruptive event, event at the surface of the sun. So what were the science advances so far? And the energies of ENAs uh, that contributed are on the right. So in the magnetospheres, it was uh, revealing global configuration, dynamics of magnetospheric storms, asymmetry of the ring current, for example. Lower altitude ENA emission hotspots were uh, discovered uh, at the mirroring points. And also uh, planetary magnetospheres, uh, Saturn, were studied. In the heliosphere and the local interstellar medium, uh, the discovery of the ribbon and the, the belt in the NAs challenged our current concepts of, of uh, interaction, and we still don't have the clear uh, answers what it is and how it works. Also, there was a new window to the properties of the interstellar medium surrounding the solar system, in particular the velocity vector of the interstellar medium. Uh, then the solar eruptive events, this is a new thing, just recently happened. It may provide a new window to the pro on production of solar energetic particles uh, at flare, in flares and in coronal mass ejections. Also, the first ENAs were detected uh, when the solar wind ions reflect from the surface of the moon as neutrals. So what are the challenges to the new missions based on the lessons learned. First, the first lesson is that no unanticipated major problems or obstacles emerged from the space experiments. So they were sort of envisioned. The main challenge remained. It's extremely low intensity of ANA fluxes, which requires very large geometric factors of instruments, which is a major challenge to miniaturizing instrumentation and put on the smaller satellites. And uh, it also calls for effective suppression of any kind of background and noise. There's another challenge for NA imaging, and which is actually a generic challenge for all imaging experiments. When you try to image a very complex three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional image plane. So here, improved statistics can help. A stereoscopic imaging obviously should help, and a combination with in situ measurements is uh, helpful, and this is something that uh, uh, on the magnetosphere has been tried using data from in situ data from Themis and DSMP, and in the heliosphere, Voyager provides uh, some data in the heliospheric interface, and the interstellar probe in the future uh, could provide similar information. 
So the, where are the required advances? It's an improved angular resolution, improved energy range, extending energy range to the high energies, and better suppression of noise. Now, speaking about angular resolution, uh, there's a very important to note is that all instruments fall into two categories. One category is a so-called single pixel instrument with a very large geometrical factor but pointed in one direction. And then you have to, using your spacecraft, to scan the sky to obtain the images of the required, uh, in the required direction. The second category are the instruments with the intrinsically wide field of use, but with the capabilities to extract the directional information of incoming ENAs within this uh, large field of view. Now, this latter kind of instruments has a fundamental limitations because thin foils, or sometimes films, that are sitting in the front of these instruments, they create a straggling, uh, that means spreading en energies of the incoming particles, and uh, scattering. And this places the uh, fundamental restrictions uh, for imp an improvement of energy resolution using this approach. So another major topic is uh, suppression of the background due to plasma and energetic particle environment. And again, because fluxes are so small, it is essential basically to kill any and all possible sources of noise. Now, what emerged that collimators and deflectors that are used to remove ions are very complex. Extreme ultraviolet coming from all directions in space and some energetic electrons that may leak inside the collimator may ionize outgassing atoms and molecules inside the collimator, creating ions that may get inside the instrument and they are indistinguishable from energetic neutral atoms. So suppression of this uh, kind of source became a major, major issue. Now also development of the dedicated deflectors for the ENA instruments with energies higher than 100 kilo electron volts and maybe mega electron volts is a major challenge and I'm not sure that it is known how to proceed in this direction. Uh, in the low energy ENA, say below uh, 1000 EV, there's a lot of work needs to be done to improve the understanding of the physics that is uh, in the, involved in the surface conversion of the particles. And also uh, there's a challenge of uh, producing uh, calibration facilities, production of neutral particle beams with the energies below say 1000 or 2000 kilo electron volt is a major, major challenge. So on the mission and the spacecraft level, there are other challenges. Now, some, uh, uh, some missions obtaining full sky maps rely on the space spinning spacecraft, and such spacecraft do produce uh, full uh, sky maps, but the duty uh, factor or the or dwell time in different areas of the sky varies one or two orders of magnitude which is a major disadvantage. Now, libration points L1 and L2, sun Earth libration points are important to investigate. In the magnetosphere imaging, we have uh, Earth-Moon libration points uh, that could be very advantageous putting a spacecraft, looking at the Earth and just uh, a magnetosphere environment and get, studying that. Now, knowledge of the exosphere is also very important. Now, exosphere is three-dimensional. Uh, it's uh, varying in t it varies in time, and uh, we have to know it much better, and this remains main just challenge. Now, another thing, putting ENA instruments on the small spacecraft allows to have multi-point measurements, like I say, constellation of CubeSats. In the first example, it's on the uh, Berkeley is flying, QC Berkeley is flying with the career, this uh, instrument on a CubeSat, but having such instruments is very uh, difficult, and it's a new area how to optimize constellation and instruments. And finally, to get uh, to the, what we can expect. So in the magnetospheres, we need to put uh, a, uh, angular resolution better 1%, in heliospheres uh, one degree, in the heliosphere maybe one or two degrees. Uh, in the sun uh, uh, eruptive events, extend energy range, which actually may open a way for advanced warning capabilities for human spaceflight beyond LEO, it's very important. And all can, other techniques can be used to study interaction of the, uh, the solar wind with the uh, as open non-magnetic celestial bodies and planetary exospheres. So finally, unanswered science question call for advancing instrument capabilities. New instrument physics and techniques do answer science questions, but they bring even more questions 
in addition to answering existing questions, history repeats, and I'm sure that the next generation of winning experiments will lead to answers and to new challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh